multiple webinars um, that we have held uh, with MSU faculty members, Pa Rector, our Professor Swaidi, has also uh, uh, given a lecture at an MSU course. Um, I believe it was last semester, and we look forward to more activities. Um, and tonight we have a very, very uh, amazing speaker from our MSU Department of Psychiatry and also the um, Director of the Muslim Mental Health Consortium. Um, please allow me to um, first though uh, give the floor and mic to Professor Suaidi um, for the beginning of our event this morning. Silakan Pak, the mic is yours. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone in Indonesia, and good evening uh, for our very best friends in the United States, States of America. Um, uh, I have a very small space of time this morning <laughs> to open this, uh, officially open this uh, very important uh, program, because uh, I am right now in the middle of a uh, a meeting, uh, what a yearly meeting with all directors all over Indonesia, and with the also the general director of Islamic uh, University uh, here in uh, Surabaya. So first of all, um, uh, I would like to thank, to uh, particularly uh, Professor Parha Abasi, for allocating your time uh, to be here. Uh, this afternoon, uh, this is this evening, and uh, also thank you very much, Professor Teto Walio, for uh, having uh, helped us uh, from the very first time up until uh, today, and and to make all the programs uh, take place and uh, very smoothly. Um, second of all. This morning, uh, last, last last night, I met with uh, Professor uh, Ali Ramdani, the general director of uh, uh, Islamic University. And I told him that a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, I think, I have already um, sent a letter to him to ask whether it is possible or if, if there is no, um, general rule about this yet, I would like to request how to uh, what, uh, to have a program with international lecturers, uh, but only one or twice face-to-face uh, -face class. And the rest uh, were by, uh, uh, what, uh, like this, uh, by Zoom, using Zoom. And he told me this morning that they are working on that right now. Why, why do I ask about uh, this? Because we have already uh, in this, this era of uh, 4.0 uh, industrial revolution, where we, all, even though in some, in, 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 in some uh, perspective, we are forced by the uh, coronavirus to have this <laughs> kind of uh, academic activities. So um, I'm waiting for the uh, response to this. And I would like to ask uh, Dion to talk about this uh, in more details, because if we can have this uh, what credit uh, class with like uh, two or three subjects, I think we have, what do we, uh, we, we've moved forward uh, and very uh, in, in in a very what uh, we are going to contribute to a very important steps of this kind of uh, collaboration, and I think not only with uh, State Islamic University Sultan Tahmi Jambi, but also with with other uh, forty eight Islamic universities across Indonesia. So Dion, if you can uh, what uh, discuss about this later on. Um, and let, let me know uh, uh, how uh, our friends respond to this. Sure, and of course, we have, we have. Uh, I uh, I have to ask to the Ministry of Religious Affairs what kind of re regulation uh, that we can, we can use, or if there is no regulation like this, and we would like to ask them to uh, what uh, to ask Indonesian government 
because I think this is the time already we talk about this kind of collaboration. And third of all, uh, thank you very much all participants. I've seen here 41 already, and I believe that uh, there will be more participants who would like to join this kind of a very important uh, 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 development uh, uh, series. And uh, I would like to share just a little bit. Mental health, uh, or uh, physical health, also like environmental health and other things. Uh, we used to be, we don't talk very much about this in Islamic university, particularly in Jambi. But right now, since we change the paradigms of uh, knowledge at UIN Sultan Tohas Jambi, everything is, is possible right now. We talk about environmental, we, we talk about animals, we talk about uh, criminals, crimes, we talk about so many things right now. I have already established 18 uh, center of studies in order to respond to this. And I think the only Islamic university in Indonesia which have this kind of uh, centers only in Sultan Toha Sabrin Jambi, which make us possible to collaborate with uh, what we call general universities or secular universities. So I have already also informed to the general director of Islamic universities about this. And in a few hours to come this afternoon, I am going to be one of the chair of the, uh, what the, the meetings talking about this kind of activities, and uh, how we move forward from uh, here. Uh, because uh, Islamic universities, we used to go uh, to use uh, uh, to uh, what to stick with Islamic very small things, and now we would like to go out from there to move from there. What we call now, not only thinking. Uh, out of the box, but sometimes we do think without the box. We have to make some kind of innovation in order to what to see the world uh, better. So what we are doing right now. So I'm very happy that we have Professor Farha Zaman Abbasi this this morning, this afternoon. Sometimes we use different <laughs> things because totally yeah. totally different morning and afternoon. But uh, so uh, thank you very much for everyone who have joined this. And um, uh, thank you very much, Dion, who have already, already worked very hard uh, we, uh, we, to make these uh, kind of uh, activities uh, run very well. And uh, we're, let's we start this uh, for uh, some of us uh, who are Muslims uh, by uh, setting uh, Basmala. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you very much. Uh, joy, uh, enjoy this uh, very important health uh, or a uh, seminar. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikum salam warahmatullahi I'm sorry, everyone. I have to leave now. I have to go to downstairs to join the meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. Prof. Swaidi. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Great. I'm leaving now. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So Thank you. Uh, we'll go into uh, Dr. Abbasi's seminar um, talk. And, but first of all, let me allow me to introduce Dr. Farha Abbasi to everyone. Uh, Dr. Farha Abbasi is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Michigan State University and staff psychiatrist at MSU Student Health Center. Uh, Dr. Abbasi has contributed to a range of topics including the psychological effects and implications around suicide, terrorism, bullying, and harassment. She's the founding director of the annual Muslim Mental Health Consortium. Under Dr. Abbasi's leadership, the psychiatry department at MSU with joint funding from MSU's College of Osteopathic Medicine launched the Muslim Mental Health Initiative, including a conference and journal focusing on Muslim mental health. A primary goal of the consortium is to take advantage of the existing expertise within Michigan State University and from across the country and globally in order to advance the goals of Muslim mental health. Most recently, Dr. Abbasi contributed to the Steve Fund Crisis Response Task Force, 
a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting the mental and emotional well being of students of color or minority students in the US. The National Task Force was created to develop recommendations for mitigating the mental health risks for these students caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic and social upheaval that has followed. It's really um, a, a, a great delight to have Dr. Abbasi. And so I will give the time now, uh, Dr. Farha Abbasi, please um, you begin your so lecture. Thank you. Uh... Assalamu alaikum. Uh, let me begin in the name of Allah, the most merciful and the beneficent. I would, I just want to share my presentation. Okay, just can you guys see my presentation? Okay, let me see. So, not yet. Uh, not yet. You, not yet? Okay. Not yet. Okay. Can you see it now? Um, okay. Not yet. Not yet. Can you share it screen? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why it's giving me. <laughs> Is this the one? Yes. We see the PowerPoint. Yeah. Yep. But not the. Yeah. The presentation, just the PowerPoint file. Yeah. So yeah. let me start it from the beginning. Yes. And I can. Okay. Perfect. So, yeah. Thank you. So, first of all, uh, thank you so much to the respected uh, rector for introducing the topic. One thing which is really uh, very encouraging as a practicing Muslim and as psychiatrist for me personally is that when I look at our religion, mental health is very central and integral to our practices. So when we trace the history of psychiatry and psychology, what we consider as Western psychiatry and Western psychology, it actually realizes that the beginnings of actually the, the basis of psychology, psychiatry was established by Muslim scholars. And the first uh, psychiatric hospital was built in Baghdad. But also recently when I started reading Quran with my uh, Imam and East Lansing, um, we both came to the conclusion and realized that what we think are Western concepts are very integrated and ingrained in the context of Quran. So that's why I now, as uh, a practitioner, am actually using a lot of my principles and values that I had learned from Quranic verses and have been applying that to the care of my patients. So this is where this concept of faith-based mental health has uh, started. So I will go back and give you examples how we are doing that. But today I wanted to talk about everybody, of course, is being greatly impacted with COVID-19 pandemic. But also as a Muslim currently, we are also facing a lot of other challenges. So I want to uh, use these faith-based skills and also provide the mental health support and how we can bring it together to cope with uh, uh, all the stresses that we are facing currently. So, like I said, for the last de decade, Muslims have been fast facing an epidemic of vulnerability, persecution, displacement, and political vitriolic. So if you look at the major conflicts in the world right now, mostly are happening in uh, Muslim majority countries or are impacting Muslims directly or indirectly. On top of that, the COVID-19 pandemic and the enforced isolation that brought uh, that it brought has added another layer of trauma for this population. So we see right now in most of the geopolitical context when we see 
how Muslims are being used as a political subject, as if they are not human. They, the vitriolic uh, context of the, so like recently we saw, even in the Ukraine uh, conflict where we were all very concerned about the refugees, but the nar narrative being that if you are uh, coming from a Western country like Ukraine and are blonde and blue eyed, you are civilized or those refugees are accepted. But if you are coming from a conflict in Middle East or Africa or Syria, they are considered as a, a, a big uh, problem, right? Not being accepted. So we see this negativity increase all over the world, and especially here, even in United States, we are seeing the hate crimes have gone up against Muslims. So, you know, this is a, a, a graph I wanted to show you. So we are at somewhere between uh, orange and getting towards genocide. Uh, we are just short of genocides, but everything right now, what we call Islamophobia or identity-based bias is bias. This is where we are lying. These are bias motivated violence, right? It can be physical assaults. It can be, we have seen vandalism. We have seen cases of arson. So we are very concerned about this and this all is taking an impact on our mental health. So Muslims are all over the globe, feeling alienated, isolated, and persecuted, be it a hijab-wearing girl in India being harassed, be it in France, a Muslim uh, ban on uh, hijabs, or be it the uh, United States, uh, uh, where the, be it in the uh, United States that we are seeing uh, the negativity. I'm sorry, let me turn this. Off. So we are seeing a lot of negativity right now. Uh, that's taking an impact on us. So living, what is this living under this persistent fear, insecurity, and deepening uncertainty doing to our mental health is where my focus is right now. And like I said, Muslim women, especially those covering their heads are feeling like a geopolitical target. It can be a political debate. It could be an election in any country and the, uh, you will see the topic becomes that women wearing hijab are being harassed and have to be rescued. Or like we saw in Afghanistan, that they went to war because they wanted to rescue Muslim women there. So they, they have become victims of harassment intimidation and physical violence. And then we see, I'm really concerned, another group is the Muslim youth, right? Where, where, who all over the world are under constant suspicion as being seen and tr treated as potential threats, uh, be it United States, be it UK, be it other European countries, be it. Uh, so it's like having an impact on our uh, potential, our possibilities. But so again, why is this being done is through the media, right? Like uh, this example that Muslim woman is represented as this uh, some uh, like a very persecuted, a woman who has no power, has no agency, cannot speak about her own rights and Muslim men are angry, violent. And so this Muslim woman has to be uh, rescued, right? And th this is a, um, a TV show right now happening here in America. It was called Homeland Security that you can see all the Muslim women are faceless and they are being rescued or other pieces that if Muslim women are shown, they are shown uh, in a certain uh, stereotypical way. But another population that I'm really concerned about are the refugees or internally displaced or evacuees. 
how how is their mental health uh, doing right so unhcr estimates that there are at least 10 million stateless people worldwide uh, this figure expressly excludes Palestinians and uh, a lot of Muslim refugees are not accounted for in this number. But what is very concerning is as many as one out of three stateless person in the world, they are victim of wars and trauma. They have been forcibly displaced out of their homes. But why? is it so important for us as global Muslims is that these are children, at least half of them are children. So you will have millions of Muslim youth growing up without their belonging to any country. So they wouldn't have citizenship of any country. And what does that impact? How does that gonna impact their mental health? So, that's another piece that we have to uh, work on. So the largest number of internally displaced children due to conflict are found in the Middle East and North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. The MENA region recorded over 12 million internally displaced people as a result of conflict and violence at the end of 2019. Almost all of them lived in just three countries, Syria, Yemen, and Iraq, and around 5 million were children. These, these are very concerning uh, issues, right? These are undocumented with no proof of their nationality. Many Syrian refugee children face a dangerous and uncertain future due to the risk of statelessness, which means you do not belong to any country. You do not have a passport. You don't have an identity. So what is happening is every day, one of these ch children that we are talking about either go missing from these refugee camps or dies of starvation or disease. And this is another piece that as global Muslims, we are carrying the trauma by association, which is called vicarious trauma. So if we think of right now, this is in psychology, what we call basic needs of an individual to grow successful and live a healthy life and have a mental wellness, right? These are the needs which is self-fulfillment. Uh, uh, then you have uh, psychological needs of being wanted, being secure, um, having love, validation. But right now being a Muslim, these needs are not being met. And that's having a really detrimental impact on our mental and physical health. So what does stress do to you? Stress, real or imagined threat to physical or psychological integrity of an individual. So, I'm sorry, give me one second. Bapak Ibu boleh menuliskan pertanyaan di kolom Q&A. So, sorry, I'm back. So this stress uh, is a real or imagined threat to physical or psychological integrity of an individual. Stress when in small quantities uh, is a natural thing given to us, which is like if we didn't have stress or little bit anxiety, we won't be able to fulfill our responsibilities. We won't be able to finish our work. We won't be able to keep up with our uh, jobs. So little bit physiological stress is good. But what we are talking about here is persistent toxic stress that we all are feeling because of our own individual concerns, but then what COVID has done, but then what does being a Muslim in today's world, how is it impacting you? So all that combined is a cumulative toxic stress that we have to uh, be concerned about. 
So normally a human body is at homeostasis. Homeostasis means that there is a system that your body functions on. Like this much blood will go to heart, this much blood will go to your kidneys, this much blood is needed, this much water you should be drinking, this is called homeostasis. But when there is an injury to the body, like we can say, even like, like you know, fasting, let's take fasting. So what happens is when your body is starving or fasting, there are other systems that come in play to keep this homeostasis working so that your body does not collapse. It continues to work. This is called allostasis. But when we have this toxic stress, this ability for the body to maintain itself that gets injured and harmed. And your immunity goes down, your system starts to disrupt, your heart feels the pressure, your brain can feel the impact. And that's what we call allostatic load. Okay. So stress can affect every part of your body. It can affect your ability to focus. It can affect your sleep. It causes your body to hold stress all the time. So your muscles are tense, your heart rate is increased, your stomach, your appetite, everything gets disrupted. So intense and persistent stress stress can influence how your brain develops. Your brain structures get uh, affected. So what happens is the frontal lobe, which is our thinking brain, our decision-making brain, it gets shrunk because under stress, your body gets into the mode of being attacked. You feel like you are being attacked. So you are on the go, you feel like I have to fight back or I have to run out of this situation. What happens is you become action oriented that I have to do something. And that takes away blood from your thinking brain. So your thinking brain shrinks, your feeling brain, your emotional brain gets enlarged. So you become very emotional, very impulsive, and you're getting ready to fight, right? But this constant being in the fight mode starts to release so much stress hormone that it starts to impact the ability of your body to function. That's why people go on to develop diabetes, heart problems, hypertension, high cholesterol. So it's interesting that we invest so much time in investing into physical problems, but we don't realize that what is happening in your brain and in your mind is impacting all parts of your body. So that's where it is important to understand that, think of it this way. If you hurt your finger, the pain, actually the pain messages go to your brain and your brain releases then chemicals to take this pain away. So if you're any part of the body is hurting, brain will change. But if the brain is hurting, it will affect all the parts of the body. And especially what we are seeing right now, the trauma that we all are experiencing it's going to impact all the functioning, right? You, you can have panic attacks, you can have nightmares, emotionally, you will feel sad, hopeless, but your ability to concentrate. So the thing why it is important to uh, treat these are that it can affect your ability to study, to have career, to have healthy relationships and all that comes under mental well-being. Now coming to faith-based coping and why is it important? 
So we know that religion is very central to our Muslim identity. And we also saw that during this pandemic, when Islamic centers, especially those of us who were not living in Muslim majority countries, but even those who were living in Muslim countries, we the the not the the Islamic centers or the mas masajids closing down had a very detrimental impact on all of us, right? And especially when we saw that the Hajj had to be uh, suspended, right? that there were no people uh, doing tawaf, that had a, such an impact on us as Muslims, right? Because we believed that the biggest miracle is that Khana Kaaba always have people doing tawaf around it, right? So this created like a spiritual also trauma for us. And then we saw to Ramadan during that. And in Ramadan, how the families come together, how the community comes together, how you want to go to Masajid to pray, all of that got impacted and that created an additional trauma. We know that average Muslim household family is multi-generational, right? This connection was disrupted and that also, like we lost so many uh, older family members to COVID or uh, like the, even the rights of burial changed. You couldn't visit, you couldn't do uh, the, the uh, be there for burials and that impacted the trauma, that impacted the grief. And again, although we know that being a Muslim it is very clear that you would be tested, you would be tried. And this we see again and again in different verses of Quran, right? So no disaster strikes upon the earth or among yourself, except that is in a register before we bring it into being. Indeed for Allah, that is easy, right? So you are gonna be tested. And then I, I love this surah, that we will surely test you with something of fear, hunger, loss of wealth, lies, food, but give, give good tidings to the patient to persevere, right? And then the verse that we all know that verily in every hardship is ease. So that is the spirit that I wanted to bring to my mental health work. And then what I realized that uh, all, if we go here and read the Western uh, knowledge about who's successful, who's happy, uh, and if we read the, about their lifestyles, what are they practicing? They are practicing gratitude. They are practicing so sabr and sugar. They and simple living, right? And doing acts of kindness, doing acts of philanthropy. And where are these concepts? They were already given to us. And we saw Prophet وسلم, practicing it, right? And this is again Prophet, and they also saw death losses, grief, pestilence. We know there, there were pandemics in their times too. And we know that they said, it was clearly mentioned in the narratives that if you hear of its presence, that's pestilence or pandemic or a plague in a land, don't enter it. But if it's pressed in the land where you are, don't fly from it. So this concept of quarantine and social isolation is also coming from Islamic narrative and Islamic literature. Again, the, constantly when you are being tried, tested, there are words of encouragement also in Quran, la taknatu, la tahinu, like don't lose hope, don't get tired. And then we read, Allah burdens not a person beyond his scope, right? Surely with hardship, there is ease. So it's very interesting that you have trials, tribulations, but then there is reward. There is uh, support that is being provided throughout the Quranic verses. So we know that when we talk of Sharia, 
and it calls about talks about preservation of property, preservation of nestle. But another very important concept of Sharia is pre preservation of akal. So Islam is one religion that really brings mental competence to the center. If you are not mentally competent, you will you cannot be uh, a practicing Muslim. You can be born Muslim, but you have to be mentally clear to know, understand, practice, and say that you are Muslim. Right? That's all combined, like saying shahada, believing it in your heart, praying, fasting all action, thought, emotion, everything was brought together, but it started with mental clarity and competence. And if you were not mentally competent, then you were majnoon. You were exempt from all religious duties and actually you became responsibility of the uh, community should be taking care of you at that point. So it is very interesting that any practice, all the practice in Islam is about augmenting wellness, right? So anything that takes you away from mental clarity was prohibited. And examples, you were prohibited to act on anger because it was understood that in anger, you will not make good judgment. Alcohol was prohibited. Anything khimr, anything addictive was prohibited. Why? Because mental clarity was uh, important. And time and time again, prophets, when felt discouraged, they were encouraged to seek this mental wellness. We saw that Prophet وسلم, would go meditate, would take time away and sit in quiet and meditate. But beside that, the five time prayers in itself are a form of yoga meditation. So when you do those physical ac actions, you are stretching your body, you are bringing the blood to your brain. So the concept wellness, but every action of wellness also becomes an act of welfare. And then if you do it in community, that's the gist of Islam, right? So example, when we pray, we are praying for our spiritual wellness, but it has physical and mental benefits. Like an example, when you do the wadu, uh, the before uh, namaz, you are putting, you are doing hygiene, you are cleaning, but you are putting cold water or water on your pressure points, all the pressure points. That means five times a day you are bringing your stress levels down. And all this has now been talked about in Western science, which we already had the practices. And when we do namas, we are also doing gestures. We are releasing stress in our body and we are increasing the blood flow. But how does it become welfare? Because you are told to stand in a row, irrespective of your color, your gender, your uh, uh, socioeconomic status, you all are equal in the eyes of God. When you are praying, you are standing in one row, irrespective of who you are, you all become equal. So that becomes welfare. Another thing, when you pray in community, it, you also become aware of each other's condition. You ask like, oh, how's so-and-so doing? If you bring food, you are sharing the meal. But if you find out that somebody is struggling with illness or need emotional support or money, you, that's where the in-community system is, was built. So this is a great mental health model that all the asylums that were built for mental health wellness in Baghdad, the first ones in the history of psychology and psychiatry were based on these concepts. And they did not separate mental and physical health. It was about your wellness. 
and these were built in middle of the city so that the whole city could contribute towards taking care of people struggling. But not only that, after the illness was over, it became the responsibility of the community and the city to integrate these patients back into the society. So this is the model that we really need to go back to. Unfortunately, what we see, we have deep stigma around mental illnesses, right? And that becomes the biggest barrier in timely care for us. Um, another thing we see that if you belong to religious community, you see every struggle, like, uh, like if I go and ask, tell someone that I'm depressed, they will say that your faith is not strong or you are not praying enough, right? Or sometimes we start to see these struggle as maybe God is testing me. Maybe I shouldn't get treated. Maybe God is angry with me. So all this negative thinking comes in. On the other hand, used positively, religion and spirituality often play a vital role in healing uh, for people belonging to a religion, right? And we know that what is happening right now in America, and I see that in a lot of Muslim majority countries as well, that if you are struggling with mental illness, then the first th thing you would go to an elder in the family, but then you uh, go to a religious leader. You always want to uh, seek the help of a religious leader. Unfortunately, you don't get to a mental health provider till you're seriously ill or in a crisis situation. So that's where I think the role of mental health providers and spiritual leaders is so important that we need to work together. You also see that if you belong to a religious community, that you, when you do have depression, when you do have psychosis, which is like you break away from reality, your delusions also become very religious in nature. So you feel like God is giving you com commands. God is uh, telling you to go hurt yourself or go hurt someone else. This is also what we see. So it is very important that we differentiate what is mental illness, and what is spiritual uh, concern, right? Sometimes they overlap. Sometimes when you are struggling with your faith, you will become depressed. And sometimes when you are depressed, you will have hard time keeping your faith. So it can be a combination of both. And that's why it is important that everyone come together and work on this. This was a case from our town. This is a young kid. He was fasting and he started having his first psychotic breakdown. So he saw delusions that he's in hell and the devil is punishing him for his sins. And he thought he's having spiritual experiences. Um, so he went to Imam to pray with the Imam. Imam did, Imam did the rukaya on him and prayed with him, but also because Imam, a local Imam and I work really together, closely together, he said, I do see that this is possibly a mental health concern. So he referred him back to me. I treated him and then I told him that continue the medication, but please continue praying with the Imam. So this is the collaborative model that we are working on. So this is uh, something I do through Muslim, uh, Muslim Mental Health Consortium that uh, we kind of work together, we refer to each other. We have also trained Imams in first aid mental health training, which is um, kind of introducing them to the concept of what's depression, what is anxiety, what is psychosis and how to identify it and how to refer to a provider. Like the Imam did the training with me. So now he knows that what is spiritual concern and where is person 
uh, kind of suffering from schizophrenia. This is a picture uh, of the imam's training. Because mental illnesses can be perceived as spiritual weaknesses, addiction is another field that we think it's a moral failure. We don't see the disease part of it and we need to. And then suicides are taken as ultimate act of sins, right? A um, lot of Muslim countries, um, this is punishable uh, crime if you attempt suicide without understanding that why people get to that point, what is mental illness and how people get to that point of hurting themselves or hurting anyone else. So I truly believe, and that's the model we are working on, that faith leaders and mental health providers can be natural allies as both propagate the same goals of wellness and well-being. The roles, the boundaries have to be established, like I'm a practicing Muslim, but if it is a spiritual question or if it is a question of fiqh or faith, I am not the authority. So I should refer to the imam and let the imam answer that question. Same way, if imam is seeing depression, anxiety, they cannot treat the person. They, they can advise them, pray with them, and but refer them to a provider, a mental health specialist. So we really need more trauma-informed care in congregations where cognitive shift can happen. We, we should not look at addiction, depression, anxiety, or behaviors where, where you hurt yourself or hurt someone else as sin or faults or failure or bad behavior, we should always think like what is happening to these people for them to engage in the, these behaviors. This is what we call trauma-informed care. And that's what we are working on now. Uh, substance abuse, mental illnesses, and suicide need to be seen and understood in terms of underlying pathology and not as moral, spiritual failures of faith. Thank you. And I'll open up for questions. This is a brief introduction of what work I'm doing. Thank you so much, uh, Farha, Dr. Abbasi. Um, we welcome you to post your questions um, to respond to. Um, or to, you know, to ask for clarifications and others in the Q&A window, or also you can put it in the chat window if you'd like to. There's currently one question from Dimas Dinata, and it's perhaps more about the context that you were sharing in the beginning. Uh, Dr. Abbasi, how are Muslims, uh, how, what is the condition for Muslims currently in America or in the U.S.? I read and got some news that Islam Islamophobia is spread is uh, is spreading widely here. Is it right or is it just happening in specific areas and specific moments? Thank you so much for answering. Uh, I would say Islamophobia is very prevalent. Um, it's uh, uh, everywhere, but at the same time. There is a lot of progress happening as well. There are more Muslims becoming uh, advocates, uh, like advocating for our rights. So there is Human Rights Watch. Um, and there are people being elected, people being uh, in a, getting into important policy uh, positions. So there's a lot of work being done around it but at the same time yes islamophobia is spreading it's not only america it's happening in uh, uk it's happening in france it's happening in europe it's happening in india so i i think uh, this is a very global phenomena right now that we have to uh, really think about and uh, think about strategies how to advocate for our rights and how to continue to work on our wellness. Thank you, Dr. Abbasi. Um, there's another question uh, from Ibu Arinivasya. Uh, what do you think is the role of Indonesia 
as the biggest Muslim country population in the world in terms of helping Muslims in a minority country to cope with mental issues problems? I think Indonesia, what is really admirable is the diversity model. You are a diverse country and uh, it, it's setting a very good role model how you are working with your minorities, how minorities are represented, how is it, it's very interfaith as well initiatives that I see. So that's one thing I think the model that we all have to take in context. But also Indonesia being a majority uh, uh, a Muslim country, I think it is very important to work on the mental health concerns. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm dog sitting for my, uh, just a second. Dion, um, is that you, you have to leave to teach? No, 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 that's not me, that's not me, uh, that's why. Okay. <laughs> Bapak Ibu kalau misalnya bertanya mungkin bisa dikasih nama karena seluruh nama di sini appear Dion Ginanto. Tapi yang bertanya itu bukan saya. <laughs> so I was uh, completing so Indonesia I think um, you have the resources you have really good academic uh, organizations. I think it is so important if you integrate mental wellness into your curriculum and your uh, create awareness, because there's a lot of stigma in Indonesia as well. I think you can really set really good models for the rest of the Muslim countries to follow. And I think if we continue to have these academic ex exchanges, both countries can benefit, students on both sides can benefit from the expertise. Thank you, Dr. Abbasi. That is really encouraging that, you know, I think, I do think Indonesia has such a good potential to contribute um, and, and, and advance our own um, discussions on mental health. Right, Bapak Ibu, we welcome more questions because uh, so far I don't see any other questions yet. Or if, uh, Adia, if you have some questions. Yeah, or... I do. I do. Um, yeah, Dr. Abbasi. Uh... Yeah, um, Dr. Abbasi, thank you so much for the very, very insightful um, topic for today. Uh, my question would be, so I, I sometimes still feel stressful, you know, with, uh, I, I'm not really sure what kind of, what made me stressful, uh, but I feel stressful um, with, you know, maybe with some news that I read from TV or from the media, and I did as what you suggested, right? For example, um, make wudu and salat and, you know, do like um, prayers. But it is still, you know, like still in, in, in our heart, um, you know, and do you have any suggestion like do yeah. into deeper actions for that? Yeah, absolutely. So that's exactly the point of mental health and faith coming together that you continue to do the lifestyle changes like every day cutting down on your stress. First of all, I would say that you sit down and identify what are the triggers of your stress. Like, is it news that bother you? Then you have to uh, limit your exposure to that, right? If it is academic that going to school uh, the classes that you are taking, if that's the source of stress, then you have to sit down and say, is it because I'm not giving it enough time? Is the course difficult? Do I talk to a teacher? How do I tackle that problem, right? Is it because I'm not able to focus and concentrate? Then you, that's another direction. If it is a constant problem that you are not able to focus, concentrate or function, then it's time to talk to a mental health provider, get an assessment that where is this anxiety coming from, okay? If it is relationship issues, then tackle it there. Like, am I, is it the conflict in the relationship affecting me? Then you work with the counselor 
or um, a marital counselor or you know whatever el elder in the family so what i'm trying to say is that right now as an individual we are facing multiple challenges it could be coming from so many places right it can be our own individual concerns about children family well-being finances politics first of all you're carrying that burden but on top of that because you see news now everything we get to hear what is happening in ukraine what's happening there so you are constantly being bombarded by traumatic messages that's why it is important to take a social media break as well. But few things are very important. Taking care of your sleep, your nutrition, make sure you are taking enough time for exercise, even if it is five, 10, 15 minutes breaks that you can, but always sitting in a quiet place and regularizing your breathing. Because when you are anxious, when you are stressed, we do not breathe deeply. We are not taking in deep breaths and that creates the sense of panic and this feeling of anxiety. But after taking that accounting, you feel like, no, I've, I'm doing everything right. I'm still feeling anxious. A simple test. Consider the last two weeks of your life. Have you been more unhappy than happy? Let's say out of the 14 days, you say, oh, 10 days I was sad and anxious, only four days I was okay. Then that's an indicator that something is not right, that you need to go to a mental health provider, physician that evaluates you and diagnose that if it is depression, anxiety, that's affecting your other functioning. Um, Ibu Bell, Dr. Tirtawalio, I have one more question. It's from someone, uh, but he doesn't want to be mentioned his name. Is it okay if sure. I read it? Of yeah, course, it's yes. A, it's on my web, WhatsApp. So if, yes. we are, if we are Muslim, we can do salat to solve the mental health problem. What about those who do not have religion or who do not believe in God? Do you have any so suggestions? First, yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, let's clarify one thing. Salah is another tool to do well. But again, what I'm saying is that mental, once you have, let me give you an example. So I don't know how many of you know diabetes, when your body you, is not utilizing the sugar, okay. So when the first time patient starts to have symptoms, we call it pre-diabetic, like he hasn't developed the disease. And we tell the patient, make the lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, stress, but we don't start the medicine. But when we see that after making these lifestyle changes, the disease is still increasing and worsening, we give them some medicine. But after a while, when we see that oral medicine is not enough, we put them on insulin injections, right? Same thing with mental health. When we initially see you anxious, depressed, we say make lifestyle changes, pray, eat healthy, sleep. But if you continue to be depressed after that, then it is a disease process. That means you need medicine on top of whatever you are doing. But then if you get really serious, then we sometimes have to put you on injections for medicine. So it depends where you are, right? So it doesn't mean that if you are praying, you will not get depressed or anxious. That's the goal of the lecture here, that even if you are doing everything right, you can still get depressed, anxious, because it is a disease. It's changing your brains. And if you read the Quran and historical narrative, prophets used to get depressed. Prophets used to get discouraged. Prophets needed, would get into severe depression and then would be encouraged to use uh, meditation or use medicines. So nothing in Quran tells you not to get treated. So let me first clarify that. 
Then comes, what do people who do not have religion? You know, it's interesting. People are very flexible. Some uh, do like make exercise uh, their main goal or some uh, keep pets to help them deal with anxiety. Some become artists. So human beings have different ways of reaching to that point. But does spirituality help tranquility? Yes. We, I, what I want you to know is that faith and religion is a big gift that we have that we should be using for our resilience. I hope I clarified that. Thank you. Any, any other questions coming to you, Bion, from our audience? No, no, no. It's... Okay, because I have one question, if I okay. may. Great. Yeah, but we welcome more of your questions. But if not, I'm going to ask a follow up question. Um, Dr. Abbasi, and, and the previous question is, is related to um, my wondering of how do religious leaders model, you know, how can they model this healthy understanding between faith and mental health? Wow. Um, can religious leaders who, like you mentioned, you know, they are themselves human beings, um, you know, they may also, you know, struggle um, with stress or with even depression. Um, would they, you know, it seems that a lot of religious leaders in our societies need to mm, appear strong and not be vulnerable emotionally. Right. right. Um, so how, how can we help religious leaders to understand that it's okay to be vulnerable? It's okay to be honest. And to, I think, yeah, uh, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the work that we are doing, faith-based mental health, part of it is opening, helping because we were realizing that there was high burnt out rate, compassionate fatigue in faith mm -hmm. leaders. Um, so definitely there is a lot of burden on them uh, because right now you are, it's not only they carry their own personal losses, it could be financial, it could be, you know, loss, uh, illness, sickness, anything could happen to them too. But then unfortunately, they don't get the support from uh, because they're carrying the load of the congregation as well. The trauma of the people that they are serving, they are carrying that also. Like, you know, an imam can be called for prayer on a deathbed or can be consulted with mar marital issues or grief counseling, like they have to do so much work that we realize that their own mental health, we did a research on it and we realized that their own mental health was also getting affected. So the benefit of this uh, work that I'm doing, faith-based mental health, uh, or many other are now doing in the country is that the imams are getting aware of their own vulnerability, are more open, about seeking help, they, they don't mind uh, reaching out to counselors, therapists, or if they need to be on antidepressant, I see that change is happening. Uh, but also the imams are using their pulpits, to, uh, like we have Friday khutbah on mental wellness, we have Friday khutbah on domestic violence or addiction or suicide prevention. They have very become very important part of mental health movement. So the great model would be, and my hope is, that's why I'm doing this work with Malaysia or Jordan, or now hoping to do it in Indonesia or Pakistan, we are doing in Pakistan is educating faith leaders that, you know, how it is natural for faith leaders and mental health providers to work together uh, for the benefit of the community. And it starts like I, uh, as a mental health provider, have to be careful about my mental spiritual health. Same way a faith leader has to be careful about their faith, uh, spiritual health and mental health. So I think uh, that's the model we are creating. And that's the model I really hope to establish in Indonesia. 
Thank you, Dr. Abbasi. Any other questions from the audience or Pak Dion? Oh, you're still oh. muted. It's, Do we still have, don't because, have any? Because we, I, I got one more um, WhatsApp message. Sure. Uh, oh, sure, sure, yes. Uh, okay. Um, Maybe one last. Let's meet it. Yeah. How do we help our friend or colleague who feel depressed, but she does not want to seek help or to go to counseling or to go or to share their feeling to others? She only wants to share with you alone. I think that's where the biggest harm of stigma is, right? Mm -hmm. um, so one thing is assuring your friend that when you are depressed or anxious, it's not weakness of your faith or it's not a failing. You are not being lazy. Understand it is a disease. And like any other, like imagine your friend coming to you and saying, I have cancer, but I don't want treatment we should understand depression in the same way that would you if your relative friend come and tell you and say hey i don't want care but i have cancer or even let's say diabetes we say oh no you have to go to the doctor because you, if you don't go you will have worst consequences and that's what we are seeing right now if you do not take or do an early intervention of depression, anxiety, or uh, other diseases, mental health, mental illnesses, you have worst outcomes. You end up either hurting yourself. Uh, and when I say hurting, it's not just physically harming yourself. You can affect your education. You can affect your relationship. You can affect your children. You can affect your other family members. Or, or some people go towards unhealthy coping, like addiction or eating disorders. So there's just such bad consequences. Uh, and when we, we, if we just drop this thing, that there is the stigma, the shame around mental illness and treat it like, okay, I have this problem, deficiency of good mood hormones that's making me depressed or anxious. Like any other disease, I'm going and getting treated. So bring the stigma down. I think we need, and the stigma will come down once we have more knowledge that it is a disease. It's not something that we can control. It's not in our control. It's not a weakness that you are lazy, you don't have the willpower, or you should not be feeling depressed. That does not work. Depression can happen to the most successful people. Depression can happen to the most religious people. Depression can happen to anyone. And that's something we have to accept and create awareness about. Thank you. That's so wonderful, Dr. Abbasi. And um, hopefully we can continue the work with um, now training religious uh, leaders. Uh, Dr. Dion, maybe we can have um, follow up um, yeah. On workshops. Yeah, that um, would be wonderful if we can follow yeah. up with those uh, activities. Yeah, with imams and, and a workshop. And that is what Dr. Abbasi has been doing. So, right, right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Sure. So, if um, there are no more questions, I will return it to Dr. Dion Gananza. Thank you so much, Dr. Fahar Abbasi. I think that was a wonderful seminar. I think hopefully everyone agrees. I'm sorry for the so distractions. <laughs> <laughs> a little puppy. <laughs> the, the poor thing is zoomed out. He he's, he, he's like she's always on the zoom. <laughs> he wants she wants to talk as well. <laughs> wants attention. That's right. Oh gosh. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Dion Ginanto. I'll return well, the mic to you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tertawaliu and um, Dr. Farha Abbasi. Um, thank you once again um, for your insightful and very important um, topics and. And, and yes, as Dr. Tutor Walio mentioned, uh, we should uh, continue to follow up this activity, maybe uh, to go to broader on the religious leader, to imam and to uh, scholars um, related to uh, Muslims. And well, thank you so much. Uh, do we have a chat? Uh, no. Um, I, I just have one request. If okay. you get any feedback, please do convey it to me. 
that uh, what uh, does uh, your audience would like more information on or if there are feedbacks on uh, how I presented or if there's anything more that I can add, I would really appreciate that. Well, will do, will do. I will I'll mention to the participants. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Dr. Um, Farha Abbasi, uh, Mary, um, Dr. Isabella, and others um, participants. Uh, and I already put the on the chat box the e certificate that you can um, fill out and with your name and email, and it's automatically sent to your email. Uh, once again, thank you so much, um, Dr. Abbasi, Dr. Tirtawaliyo, and hopefully we can um, continue um, to uh, partnership. Uh, between MSU and Ujambi, especially for mental health issues. And thank you so much. And hopefully thank I can you. visit in person someday. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, that's, we have to get yes. we need to, to Indonesia. Yeah, we need to find, you know, some uh, funding to um, <laughs> get you into Indonesia. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have thank a good you. morning. Thank you. Have a good and morning. have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye. Pamit ya. Ya, bye bye. Tapi selamat mengajar, Bapak dan Ibu. Selamat malam juga buat Mbak Bella. Oke. <laughs> <laughs> Oke, okay. okay, nanti kita follow up ya. Ya, kita harus follow up ini uh, seperti yang di Malang kan ya. Ya, seperti yang di Malang atau yang lain. Atau modelnya lain juga boleh. Mm. So we can explore. Great. Oke. Oke, bye-bye. Mohon izin ya, yeah. zoom yeah, saya izin. tutup. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Thank you, Dion. Terima kasih semua. Oke, okay, bye. Yeah. Selamat pagi. Selamat malam.